1994, we had to pipe some water, build some cross fences. Uh, my, my first rule of thumb that I've kind of come up with to keep things simple is that you move cattle fast when the grass is growing fast and slow when it's growing slow. Now I know we can complicate that and make it a little bit harder to understand, but I think that's fairly simple and that's, that's the way it is. You don't want the same plant eaten twice before those cattle are moved. Simple as that. Second rule of thumb, put the highest number of cattle in the smallest possible area for the shortest period of time. When we do this, we'll maximize our rest periods, we're going to maximize our production, grass and beef, and we're going to maximize our profits. Now the good thing about this is that we determine how intense we want to do that. You know, there are people in this room that are parts of the year are moving cattle three, four, five times a year, a day, I mean. There's probably people in this room that refuse to move cattle more than five or six days, every five or six days. You get out in the desert where I live and, you know, some of those guys, if they move more than every once, once every ten days, that, it's not going to happen. Uh, you've heard Jim talk, you've heard Neil Dennis talk. Uh, you know, this same rule of thumb applies no matter where you are and who you are. I'm going to quickly go through some reasons that we implemented this. Reduce and eliminate supplemental feeding. And I probably need to stop here. There's a difference between reducing expenses and eliminating expenses. If I'm only going to reduce expenses, I'm going to have to look at that same expense every year, aren't I? We're going to have to discuss ways to reduce that expense every year if, if inputs go up. If I can find something I can eliminate, I don't have to deal with it again. That's critical. Most of you, maybe not in this group, most of the people I talk to, in the back of their mind, they're saying there's absolutely no way I can reduce or eliminate anything else. I'm stuck where I'm at. And they're losing money. <coughs> what should they do? Sell out. Sell out. <coughs> We're at the top of the market. Sell your farm, sell your ranch, sell your cattle. Go do something else. If you can't make it work, now, you're not going to make it work when the prices go down. Anyway, the, the, we wanted to reduce or eliminate our supplemental feeding. The only time that our cows in eastern Colorado receive any hay is when the snow is too deep or too crusted for them to dig through. And that's not very often. About every nine or ten years, we'll have to feed a little bit of hay. But we're not going to starve cows. The cows can graze through snow and will graze through snow. If I've done my job, then left some grass there. The taller the grass, the, deep, the deeper the snow that they can graze through. We wanted to improve our rangeland, forage quality, quantity, and diversity. And increase total beef production per acre. Again, I don't care how big my calves are or your calves are. This is what we need to be looking at. Beef production per acre. With very simple, low in intensity management, I don't think it's at all difficult to increase beef production by 50%. It may take two or three years to get there, four years maybe. And that's pretty amazing. Some of you guys are probably going to tell me you're, you've increased beef production by what? Where's Neil Dennis? He's talking to somebody. Okay. <laughs> I can talk about Neil then since he's, he's over there. Neil told me a couple of years ago, he said, com compared to conventional grazing, not you know, the type of grazing he used to do years and years ago, he's increased his production by 600%. Now, not very many people are ever going to be able to do that. I, I think Jim Garrish is talking about people in, in Idaho that's 400% though, aren't you? Or 500? 400. 400. I mean, good grief. I mean, that's like... Uh, Having 100 acres and turning it into 400 acres. That's like having 1,000 acres and turning it into 4,000 acres. Do you understand that concept? You're buying a ranch four times bigger for nothing. Yeah, you're buying a ranch four times bigger for nothing. I'm glad you're here to do the math for me. <laughs> Earl says, no, Ed, we ain't overstocked. We're just under rain. <laughs> What's the reason... This state's probably one of the greenest states, the best grazing state in the, in, in the nation. Why would anybody feed hay every year in Missouri? Habit. Habit. 
Overstock. Overstock. I think that's probably the main reason. You know, if you know how to manage your grass, and if you're not overstocked, that you should be, you know, you should rarely have to feed hay. But I notice the farther east and south I go, you know, I'll get clear down in Alabama where it's green in January, and those guys say, well, you, you might not have to feed hay in Colorado, but we have to feed hay down here in Alabama. Does that sound lo logical? The reason is they eat all the grass in six months, then they have to feed hay for the next six months. But I've got a neighbor that lives about 10 miles down the same road I live on, and he says the same thing. He says, well, kid, you can do what you're doing. He says, well, we can't do it over here. I don't have enough grass. He's got about six sections of grass. Now, that's not huge in eastern Colorado, but it's big enough. What's his problem? Too many cows. Or not enough fences. Or not enough fences. <clears throat> Poor management. Anyway, that's that's a, my little tidbit on the grazing. Now, the, you've already heard the experts talk about grazing. Now we're going to talk about matching your production cycle to your available forage resources. And when I talk, when I say production cycle, I mean things like calving and weaning and those sort of things. The cycle that we have. Have you ever wondered why wild animals don't have their babies in February and March? What would happen in Rye, Colorado, if the deer had their babies in February, right? Wouldn't be any deer. Wouldn't be any deer. Would that hurt your feelings? Um, probably not. <laughs> There's a reason wild animals don't have their babies in the middle of the winter. Part of it has to do with forage availability, nutritional value. I think one of the bigger things that we don't really understand is the photo period, the day length period. There's something there, and it was built in in creation. Uh, we may not understand it, but it's still valid. This is this represents a forage availability curve for most of North America. Uh, represents my ranch, Greg's ranch, who also is in Colorado. Uh, several others that are in this room. <coughs> forage availability, and nutritional value is fairly low until new growth begins in the spring. It peaks fairly quickly, and then gradually declines into the fall. If this were your ranch, well, let me ask you this question. When is your cow's highest nutritional requirement? At what point in her production line? Lactation. For Lactation. <coughs> right before, during, and after giving birth. <coughs> so if this were your ranch, when, when would you be calving? Springtime. Right in here? Sure. <coughs> First of summer. It, to, to me, in, in my part of the world, this is going to be like May 15th to June, through June. Many of you, though, are living in this green area. This is what I call fescue country. It's a little different than eastern Colorado. Uh, the red dots here represent uh, federal cattle company producers. These are producers we have in or near fescue country. Your forage curve looks different than ours, doesn't it? This is what it looks like. This is a rough semblance of what it looks like. You've got kind of a hump here in the spring with quite a bit of toxicity. You've got that dreaded summer slump, and you've got a little bit bigger hump in the fall with a little lower toxicity. What's the problem with this, this uh, forage curve here? What do we need to fix if we can? Summer slump. What would you do to do that? Move to Colorado. Move to Colorado. <laughs> Greg's got a ranch for sale. <laughs> we can add legumes and or warm seasons to, to grasses to fill that summer slump. You know, basically what, we're, what we want to try to do is level this off or maybe even increase it, but we sure don't like this going clear down like that. So we're going to try to build it, build it up. Uh, through mob type grazing, management intensive grazing, the cows will do a lot of that work for you. They will change the land. You don't have to have tractors and mowers and planters and fertilizer and those things to do that. It will change through proper management, grazing management. I can always get in a good argument when I come to Missouri and talk about calving seasons. <coughs> Some graziers in Missouri are calving in May and June with good results. 
<coughs> I've talked to a couple of them here today. Others will say, you know, we can't do that. And they're having late March through April with good results. Jim Gary says, I hope he's still saying this, fall calving may be your best bet, but let me finish that statement, but only if you are stockpiling fescue for winter grazing. If, you are not, if you're going to feed hay to your cows, it really doesn't matter when you calve, Jim Garrish. And again, I'm kind of preaching to the crowd here, I hope. You guys have a, a great environment to work in. I mean, you have some obstacles there. But the, op the, the goal that we want to achieve is we want to be able to calve in sync with our forage resources to where we have no inputs or low inputs. Any thoughts or questions before I move on? I ran through that fairly quick. I don't know what time it is. Can anybody tell me? I don't know. What, why might fall calving be the best? Why might fall calving be the best? I'm going to attempt to answer this. It's going to be because of, of that, that hump over there. I mean, that, with, with fescue, that's a great, great uh, grass for fall and winter grazing. Jim, do you want to add to that? And with toxicity below, it's longer if you get cow bread in Missouri in November, December than it is in June or July. Okay. Higher cabbage season, better cabbage weather, more toxicity in the best season, and get a better market in the spring. Well, again, what we're trying to do, no matter where you live, you need to match your production cycle to the forage resources you have. You know, when God created Missouri, fescue wasn't here. You know, that's why the deer still have their babies in May and June. But fescue is here, and it's probably going to be here forever. So we need to learn to live with it. Any other thoughts or questions? Ten after four. Say that again. Ten after four. Ten after four, thank you. We can, folks, we can take a short break here. That was supposed to, I was supposed to do that. I kind of hate to turn you loose as late as it's getting if, if we can keep on going. Okay. If, if you need to go get a drink or go to the bathroom, go ahead. See you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to keep right on going. I'm going to talk about... Now, let me get past all this. Let, let me stop here. Not all of you are receiving our newsletter. I, I kind of watched people going around picking up our newsletter, so I'm, I'm quite sure that half of this crowd is receiving our newsletter, the other half isn't. That's kind of my, my observation. So if you'd like to receive our, week, our bi monthly newsletter and our weekly emails, send me an, an email down here to kidfavorcattle.com or give us a call uh, or sign up. There's a sign up sheet out there on the table. This is the third key, matching cow size and type to your available forage resources. I'm going to take a, a drink of water here. This is, <clears throat> I think, Probably the main reason that uh, Dave asked me to come down here was to talk about genetics. And I, I'm very passionate about genetics. I mean, this is, this is my favorite part, but having a perfect cow and not getting everything else right doesn't make sense. For example, in eastern Colorado, if I've got the perfect herd of cows and I'm trying to calve them in February, how's that going to work? It doesn't work. What I want here, when I say match cow size and type to the resources on my ranch, what I want is I want a cow, or rather a whole herd of cows, that can survive strictly on what my ranch produces with no inputs. I mean, if we're, if we're going to get serious about this, match my ranch, if I have to put anything into that cow, she doesn't match my ranch. Now that's probably a big dream that I can't achieve, but that's where we're going to start this, this 